years back when I was a lay person in Thailand. I was visiting a, a family in central Thailand, and they took me to this monastery where there's an old monk who'd made protective talismans. They were little birds that were supposed to be called protecting birds. And you'd get one and you'd put it up under the eaves of your house or someplace high up in the house. It's supposed to protect everybody in the house, keep the house peaceful. And the old monk was very old and quite sick, but he sat up to receive us and was very kindly. And as we left, I happened to notice scrawled on one of the walls in English with the words, Don't love. I was very surprised. One, because I came from a country where love was considered to be the highest religious emotion. And two, because I'd heard so much about the Buddhist teachings on loving-kindness. But as I got to know his teachings better, I realized that the word metta is not loving-kindness, it's goodwill. The word for love, bema, is something else again. The Buddha didn't have much positive to say about bema, or love. There was a time when a group of Brahmins who had suddenly gotten faith in the Buddha came early one morning, getting ready to prepare food for the Buddha and the monks as they came out for their alms round, making a huge racket. And the monk who was attending the Buddha at the time, Nagita, got called into the Buddha's presence. And the Buddha said, who is that out there making that noise like a bunch of fishmongers? And Nagita said, oh, those are the Buddhist Brahmins who are, have new faith in the Buddha. And the Buddha said, I want nothing to do with them. And I've forgotten the Nagita's precise words, but he said something to the fact, well, you know, come on, <laughs> be good to them. Their faith is new. And the Buddha said again, I have, want nothing to do with them. He says, what do you get out of food? You get excrement. What do you get out of love? The mind gets altered and you suffer pain, sorrow, grief, and despair. There's another passage where he talked about how closely intertwined love and hate are. If you love someone, then the people who are good to that person you're going to love too, regardless of whether they're good people or not. If they're bad to the person you love, then you're going to hate them, regardless of whether they're right or not. If someone's good to someone you hate, you're going to hate them. If they're bad to someone you hate, you're going to love them, regardless of whether they're right or wrong. So when the Buddha is talking about universal metta, he never says anything about universal love. He does talk though about universal metta, goodwill. It's not the idea that everybody's good and therefore we should love them. There are actually some passages where the Buddha talks about goodwill as protection, both from yourself and from others. In other words, if you realize you've been behaving in an unskillful way, you want to develop goodwill for yourself and for other beings so that you can strengthen your determination not to repeat that unskillful behavior. Because you realize your motivation influences your actions. And so you really got to work on your motivation. Whether it comes easily or not, you want to remind yourself you don't want to harm anybody. Partly because of the simple principle of karma. You harm others, they're going to harm you. Or as the Buddha pointed out in that story about King Basanity and his queen, Malika, there's no one in the world that you're going to find that you love more than yourself. But you have to reflect also that everybody else has that same fierce love for themselves, so you should never harm them. He doesn't say why, but you can think of at least two reasons. One is that if you love yourself that intently, it's not fair if you harm others who love themselves intently. And secondly, it's not wise. If your happiness depends on their suffering, they're not going to stand for it. 
So it's not because people are lovable that you spread thoughts of goodwill to them. You realize you need protection. And you want to be able to draw on that attitude of goodwill with regard to anybody at any time. It's a case where the Buddha talks about the bandits who have grabbed you and are savagely sawing off your limbs with a two-handled saw. And he says, start with thoughts of goodwill for the bandits, and then from the bandits spread it out to everybody else. Now, at that moment, the people in the world who are going to be hardest to feel goodwill for are those bandits. So you've got to prepare yourself. Start with someone you find easy to feel goodwill for, someone that you can, with all honesty, say, may this person be happy. In some cases that person may be yourself, and in other cases maybe somebody else. You may have some trouble wishing your own happiness. So find somebody that you do find easy to think, okay, may this person be happy. And the phrases you use don't have to be elaborate. And it's not something you would just keep repeating the phrase. You would just pose that idea in the mind and see if you agree with it. See if there are any members of the committee who would eject. And then start spreading that thought to another person, then another. And get yourself in there at some point. And if you have trouble feeling goodwill for yourself, ask yourself why. You might say, well, I'm not a good person or whatever, and that, it's, that doesn't matter. It's not because people are good that you spread goodwill to them. It's because you don't want to harm them. And from there you keep spreading it out, spreading out, until you've got a sense of at least a certain group of people that you feel goodwill for. And then ask yourself, is there anybody out there that you really do have trouble feeling goodwill for? And some faces will probably pop into your mind. And so you have to ask yourself, what would you gain from this person's suffering? Part of you may say, well, they deserve to suffer. Well, the Buddha never s says anything about people deserving to suffer or not deserving to suffer. He simply says that there are, peop there are actions that lead to suffering and actions that lead to happiness. And everybody's mix is very complex. And just because someone has some, done something negative doesn't mean that they really have to suffer. Think of that image of the lump of salt in the river. If you've done unskillful things in the past, but you develop an attitude of goodwill, that's unlimited. And that's going to mitigate the impact of your past bad actions. This principle applies to other people as well. If they can develop an, an attitude of universal goodwill, try to change their ways, wouldn't that be a much better thing for the world than to see them punished, see them squirm one way or another? Because after all, when people are punished in that way, they often don't learn the lesson and actually get more entrenched in their own sense of their rightness and the unfairness of the punishment. So the world would be a much better place if everyone could develop an attitude of goodwill. And that's part of what we wish for, not only that we want them to be happy, but we also want them to understand the causes of true happiness and to act on them. And that's something you could really wish for everybody. Just for protection, that we try to develop this attitude of protection for ourselves, protection for the people around us, protection for the world as a whole. You don't have to think about whether beings are lovable or not lovable. It's just that when you think about all the suffering there is in the world, you say, isn't there already enough? Do you have to wish more suffering on yourself or more suffering on other people? Wouldn't it be better if we could all 
learn how to be skillful. This, of course, doesn't mean that everybody will become skillful, everybody will find true happiness. It also doesn't mean that you don't have to protect yourself from other people's unskillfulness. All too often we confuse the idea of metta with a kind of Pollyannish attitude towards life that everybody deep down inside is a good person and if we only allowed them to show their goodness, they'd be very happy to show their goodness. Well, that's not the case. There are a lot of people, when you are kind to them, will see that as a sign of weakness. So you do have to protect yourself. But the trick is learning how to protect yourself in a way that's not harming anyone else. The breath is helpful here when you have a sense of your own energy field being filled with good energy. It makes it harder for people's unskillful energy to invade your field. The image the Buddha gives is of a solid wooden door and someone throws a ball of string at it. The ball just bounces right off because of the solidity of the door. You want to make your sense of comfortable full breath that solid. as opposed to the times when your body is not immersed with mindfulness and your mindfulness isn't immersed in the body. When that's the case, he compares it to a lump of clay and someone tries to throw a stone into it, and of course the stone is going to make a big impression on the clay, because the clay is so weak. So you can develop an attitude of healthy breath filling the body, a healthy attitude in filling your mind. That's your strength. That's your protection. As for whether people are going to be good or not, you can't let your goodwill depend on that. So you want to take an unsentimental attitude towards goodwill. That actually makes it a lot easier to maintain. Because you're trying to go around loving everybody, and then you run into somebody who's just really evil and really cruel. You're going to pull back into your shell. So what you want instead is an ability to go through the world, either goodwill as your protection, with your breath as your protection, knowing that you're going to need protection. A lot of people out there you can't trust. That was another thing that really struck me when I first met a John Fuang was one of his statements, as you if you trust a path and if you trust people, you're going to end up sorry for it. And then he explained, he says, trusting the path is maybe a path you've walked over many, many times. And you get so that you feel, well, I don't have to carry my flashlight, I know this path is safe. Well, that might be the night a snake is in the path. And the same with people. People may have been good to you, but it's not the case that they always will be. So you've got to learn how to take as your nourishment what goodness you can find in yourself, what goodness you can give rise to in yourself. This is where goodwill is very important. You can think about the fact that you're here, you're not wishing any harm on anybody. So if harm does come to you, you're not going to feel guilty or that somehow it was a punishment for your unskillful attitude. Just chalk it up to past karma and leave it at that. It's a much cleaner and more bearable way of thinking. Of course, in the beginning it is easier when you can find goodness in other people, and that's something you want to look for, but you're not pretending that they don't have their unskillful side. The Buddha said it's like a monk who goes out and looking for rags to make a robe. And he finds some dirty rags, and so he tears off the dirty piece and takes just the good piece. Which means that you don't pretend that the whole piece is good. You realize, okay, this part is dirty, it's unusable, you, but you tear off the part that is usable. So you learn to take what nourishment you can find from other people in terms of their goodness. 
but at the same time learn how to create your own source of nourishment inside. This is one of the reasons why goodwill practice should not end with just, may I be happy, may I be happy, as you sometimes hear. How are you going to feel good about yourself unless you can also feel goodwill for others? If you look at your own mind and see that it's narrow and selfish, it's hard to gain nourishment from looking at yourself that way. But if you see that you do have goodwill for others, there are others who you wish well, there are others that you want to help, seeing that quality in yourself gives you a lot of encouragement. That whatever, whatever other faults you may have, at least you've learned how to develop some goodwill. And the more limitless you can make that, then the more nourishing it's going to be, and the more protection it's going to give to you. <laughs>